Hello everybody, welcome to Arf Arf Bark Bark. I'm James Chai, founder of uh, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, as well as working with dogs that are extremely dangerous. And, uh, oops, sorry, I should have turned that sound down. I apologize. Uh, and I apologize for the late uh, startup. Unfortunately, my Facebook was not working again. Uh, it's always a bit of an issue here. I can't wait till I get the new laptop. I can't wait till I get the uh, the new microphone and all that stuff so I can start putting out some professional looking, cleaner looking uh, broadcast. Uh, today is November 8th, Friday, 2019. This is episode number 34. And today's topic will be why dogs go outside and immediately want to come back inside repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit and just go over that part. First half of it, we'll uh, I'll, I'll go on the topics. And then the second half, um, we will uh, talk about any questions that anybody may or may not have in this regards. Okay. So if you have any questions, please save them till the end. And uh, make sure your seat belts are fastened and the arms are inside the vehicle at all times. And um, so we're just going to do that part. And... Okay, so um, I'm just going to go over a couple of the things that we have uh, to discuss. And one of them is going to be in regards to um, uh, dogs peeing. Last uh, episode on Wednesday, I talked about why dogs, uh, when they go outside and they go pee, and um, the dominant aspect that I basically said is incorrect. It's a psychological issue. It's not an alpha part of it. It's not a marking in the sense of trying to be dominant or to claim territory as per se. It's a more dysfunctional psychological issue that's going on. Uh, I want to talk about that a little bit um, last week, I mean, sorry, last episode, just want to go over this part of uh, the dogs peeing, you know, the, and, and there's a discussion I said in regards to the height of uh, another dog's pee, when you see your your dog smelling pee, and the pee is here from the other dog, or it's up higher, and people are trying to say that that's uh, uh, an alpha aspect, but a dominant aspect, a territorial aspect. Um, it is somewhat inconsequential because dogs have a hypersensitivity to smell. Uh, they're not going to necessarily gauge the height of another dog going pee. As well as you think about it, what's to stop another dog from peeing at a higher elevation? Say it's on a boulder or a rock and another dog is on top of it and they pee on it. It doesn't make your dog think, oh my gosh, there's a dog that's 20 feet tall. Your dog is just going to go, oh, okay, this is interesting. I smell the pee. I want to see where this other dog is. And, um, you know, it's just that really kind of a fundamental part is dogs really don't care where other dogs pee. They're, they're going to smell it no matter what. So we want to uh, recognize that we eliminate the aspects of a, uh, of a simplistic approach of saying that it's an alpha part when in actual fact it is an, an interest on our dog, uh, any dog's part to smell pee and go from there. Um, and, and dogs don't uh, become agitated smelling other dogs' uh, urine. And, and what I mean by that, is and that's in my pre-notes here that are inside the description of this uh, today's vlog is that um, if there was truly an issue with another dog smelling our pee I'm sorry not our pee, smelling uh, another dog's pee and the height as well you would see an indicators where the dog is sniffing sniffing and they, if they were to smell upwards kind of like the friendly giant right look way up if they were to smell all the way up there that would indicate then if the dog was concerned about the height of another dog they would then start exhibiting manifesting almost immediately after sniffing the pee and sniffing the height of the pee then your dog would then start going oh my gosh i'm a bit nervous now because there's a really gigantic dog that's gone pee here now like i say dogs don't know uh they're targeting very well they tend to miss a pole if they're peeing on it. They um, don't always hit the the boulder, the rock, whatever it is that they're trying to smell and pee on. And when it comes to large giant breed dogs, they're going to miss the pole most most times, 90, uh, just almost always because they're just so big and they don't see where they're targeting. And more than anything else, not because they don't know about it, they, they kind of don't really care. And they're just doing that part as... Uh, another part of just identifying themselves and I'll kind of talk about that later on why some dogs pee on top of other dogs pee is not a dominant aspect it's a codependency it's a, a, a desire to create an affinity or some sort of relational um, behavior okay so um, the other part is uh, when it comes to the sniffing dogs at other height their urine marks the pee marks where the dog is uh, peeing um, our dog our dysfunctional dog is not going to really be that concerned about where the other dog is peeing, uh, the height of the other dog. Because when you see your dog or any dog going up to another dog, 
they're going to pee, and they're going to sniff where the other dog's uh, genitalia is, no matter what. So you can see a chihuahua trying to smell uh, um, uh, a Great Dane's um, uh, penis, uh, right, to, to get the scent on it. Uh, they're going to they're gonna try to smell it anyways. It doesn't change the behavior. If the dog was concerned about another dog's size, then that dog, hi Rita, then that dog would literally avoid bigger dogs. Because just by socialization, by, by interaction, uh, you're, the, the dysfunctional dog can see another bigger dog and go, oh my gosh, that's where the dog is peeing because I smelled a dog, another dog's pee that's way up this high. And now I see a dog that, that is the same size. Doesn't make that dog, your dog, scared. They're going to go up and smell the pee anyways. So what I'm, as I'm trying to get this all gathered, so, because I got on, I got, uh, you know, difficulties trying to get this vlog going today. Basically, the dog, your dog, is going to smell pee no matter what the height is. It doesn't matter to them. They're going to smell pee of the other dog, either by their, uh, their pee mark on, on, on an obstacle or an item, or they're going to see that same or similar sized dog at the dog park or on a walk, smell the dog. They're going to recognize the height and the distance. If it was really an issue, your dog's not going to smell the pee of a bigger dog without being afraid, right? So it's it's, it's a dysfunctional part of it. Uh, there is this codependency aspect of it. Uh, like I said, codependency aspect of it. So that's the thing there. Um, and then the other part is... Uh, aggressive dogs themselves are not afraid of someone else's size. They're not afraid of other dogs, bigger dog size. They're not afraid of humans who are, we are much bigger than, uh, taller than an average dog. Well, most, pretty well every dog we're taller than unless the dog's up on their hind legs. Uh, the dysfunctional dog, the aggressive dog is not going to care. The aggressive dog is going to still attack the target that it wants to, regardless if it's a chihuahua or if it is a, a large adult human being. If the dog is aggressive, they're not going to be concerned about the height. So it's just kind of, like I say, it's a bit of a simplification, trying to say that dogs are out off and stuff when they pee and marking territory and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's silly. It's a codependency issue. It's a dependency issue primarily, and then the variance of it. But um, we kind of just wanted to talk about from last week. Uh, the, so the, the topic today is uh, why dogs go, go outside. So why dogs go outside and immediately want to come back inside? And they do it repeatedly, right? You let your dog go outside to go pee or to go play in the backyard. And they kind of step out and then they come back to the door. And they're like, you're like, go pee, go play, go outside, go in the backyard, go have some fun. And your dog is just standing there wanting to come back in. And you're like, oh, just go out, go play, go pee. And you're, and the dog's just standing there at the door. Your dog uh, like, let me in, let me in. Right? So if I let Zevia out to go pee, she'll come back to the door and she'll just kind of like, okay, I want to come back I, I want to come back in. I'll open the door. Zevia will come back into the house. And then what will she do? She'll go right back to the door. I got to go out. I want to go out again. I open the door. She goes out. She's back to the door again. I want to come back in. And it repeats. And this happens to a lot of dog owners. And they're always trying to say, well, why is this happening? Why is my dog just playing games on me? Why is my dog saying that they want to go pee? I let them out and go pee, and then they just want to come back in, and they don't actually want to go outside. So what it is, is and again, back to the notes here, is our dogs are interpreting our human behavior, our physical behavior. So in the past that we have let our dogs out, we've gone outside with our dog. For example, it's a nice day. We open the door. I let Zivi out, and I go outside to kind of like smell the fresh air and look around. And Zivi is in her head. She's like, oh, good. We're going outside. We're doing an adventure together. Even if it's in the backyard, our dog, Zevia, my dog, Zevia, is going to be, yeah, we're going outside. And then I go back inside the house. <laughs> and Zevia's like, what? You're leaving me out here by myself? You're not going to hang out with me? You're not, what? We're going, are we, are, am I supposed to go back inside? That's what's going to go through Zevia's head. Okay, um, my human has gone back inside and I thought I, I was outside and they were going to come outside with me. So it's our physical uh, behaviorisms that cause us to make adjustments that our dogs interpret at a tenth of a second process time of us giving them wrong signals. That's essentially it. We're giving them our dog wrong signals by going in and out of the house. Even if it is, again, we, we open the door, let them out, we walk outside, standing outside on the deck, and then I walk back inside and my dogs are like, oh, I thought we were all going to hang out outside. 
because they're used to the fact that when I go out the door, front door, back door, whichever, when I go out the door, I go with them or I bring them with me or one or two of my dogs with me on a, on a, on a car ride for an errand or I go to the backyard and I hang out with them for a bit or as I usually do every other day is I go out and pick up, you know, a couple of bags of poop and my dogs are like, oh, cool, dad's outside, yeah, and they're all excited. But if I open the door and I don't go out, my dog, Zevia, my dogs are expecting me to go outside from what I've done beforehand. So as I close the door and I stay inside the house, they're going to look at me like, I thought you were coming outside. Why are you not coming outside? And so what happens then is we feel bad, so we open the door and our dog's like, oh, oh, okay, so I'm supposed to come back in. So we give our dog mixed signals. If we open the door and we went outside, our dog will be standing there going, oh, we're, you're coming outside finally. And then your dog, well, if you move away from the door back uh, into the backyard, your dog will then start to explore the areas and go around. If I let my, uh, if I let Zevia back inside, when she comes back to the door, like I open it up, she runs out and then she comes right to the door going, okay, come on out, dad. If I let her back inside, she will come back inside and she will stay inside if I don't go out or if I don't open the door again. She'll stay inside for the rest of the day because she's thinking, okay, didn't get, we're not, I wasn't going pee. I thought we were going on an adventure, but we didn't. And so I didn't get a chance to go pee and I'm not going to go pee because it's not the right time to go pee because they think we're going to leave a bunch of things, right? So um, uh, Zebia will hold her pee for the rest of the day unless I make a concerted effort to take her outside. And at that time, I'll take Zevia outside and I will go outside myself. And all the other dogs will go outside at the same time because of course I talked about the seniority, but all the other dogs will go outside, have some fun, and they'll see that I'm outside with them. Once I go back inside, they think to themselves, oh gosh, dad's leaving us, dad's going inside, dad's gonna bring us some food, you know, for like breakfast or, or dinner. Then they go, okay, I want to come back inside. So it's when you do um, make your intentions to let your dogs out and you have no intentions yourself of going outside, don't make any indications with your own body behavior towards outdoors. So you want to stand somewhat firmly in your body. If you open the door, you're going to be firm in your body. You're not, not going to make intentions to, to indicate even the slightest way, slightest way that you're going to step outside. You basically open the door and you go, go outside, go pee, you know, right? Give them the command, go pee, go poo, whichever it is. They run outside and you stand at the door. You can leave the door open somewhat as well. And if your dog comes back to you and they look at you like, okay, uh, what's going on? What's going on? Uh, are you not coming out or am I coming back in is what Zevia will think. I will just stand there at the door and I'll block it so they don't come back in. And I'm just standing there and I'll just go, okay, go pee. Go pee, Zevia. Go pee, William. Go pee. I'll tell the dogs to go pee. And then they'll watch me. And I just stand there and I don't make any indications. And then eventually they'll turn away and go, oh, okay, I'm going to, we, we're going to go pee now. And they'll go off and they'll go pee. If that doesn't work, then step outside. Like I said earlier, step outside. Close the door behind you because you don't want them running back into the house because they think, oh, oh, you know, dad's, dad's going to trick me. Stand outside the door and they're going to watch you thinking, okay, is he coming out or is he just standing there? What's he doing? But they won't be thinking profoundly that I'll be going back into the house because they're going to be used to the fact that I'm outside and they're going to think that I'm going to come out and play with them or I'm going to pick up poop or I'm going to be outside protecting William from Anthony trying to knock him over when William goes pee, you know, the kind of thing that Anthony thinks is funny, and I'll just be out there. And if they if they continue as a stand there, then I will walk them out into the yard a bit more, and I'll stand there. I won't give the, any of my dogs a lot of affection or attention, because one, then the other dogs start coming in, and they all want affection, and then some of them get upset with each other. And at the same time, too, is if I stand out there as I survey, as I do the seniority aspect in regards to pee and all that, I'll stand out there without engaging. And I'll talk to them, though. I won't physically, I mean, I should say I won't physically engage. I will talk to them when they come up to me. I will somewhat not be affectionate to them in the sense of I'll just stand there because I need to have them all go pee before I let them in. And they all know the routine, but again, I don't want to confuse them by 
giving them attention and they think, oh, okay, whatever. And then they end up forgetting to go pee, as you know, right? Sometimes we'll let our dogs out, they'll play around, they won't pee. And then we bring them back inside and I'm like, oh no, I forgot to take you out the pee. So I don't engage with my dogs or any of the dogs that are in at my place until they finish going pee. Once they finish going pee, then I give them affection. I play around with them. I talk to them and all that, which is passive training because I'm naturally playing with them. I'm giving them the signal in the sense of good boy, good girl, good job. You went pee, all that positive part, reinforcing that with the affection because beforehand I wasn't giving them affection. I hope this makes sense. It's a little bit off a, a, off a bit. I mean, this, um, okay, so... Uh, Right, and um, let's just see. So we talk about the dog going in and out. So like I say, is the only reason your dog comes back in and out is because they think that we were going to go outside and our dog is thinking, well, he's not going outside. I need to go back inside with my human. That's the indication, and that's why it makes sense. Um, and you'll see that when you do that again, is don't let them in, <laughs> stand at the door. Don't try to negotiate with them and say, oh, go pee, please, please go pee. Do your dad, right? right? Don't change your tone of voice. Say it in an authoritative manner, go pee, and you just stand there. Don't engage. Don't feel bad by being, you know, stern and telling them to go pee. Just stand there. And when they go off and run off because they're thinking, okay, well, you are going to come outside, then obviously. Just stand there, right? And then you do come outside. Just kind of reinforce it for them just as a passive side of things. Uh, it's a bit of a complicated part of it. And, um, uh, okay. So, um, one of the things what I'll, I'll do is uh, I'm going to kind of just briefly go over some of the topics. And then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll touch on this next uh, vlog on Monday. And I also talk about... I will talk about next Monday as well about dogs that have uh, vision impairment and how we can uh, how you can improve the quality of your dog's perception of what's going on in the home and um, so that they're not afraid and not bumping into things. Those are dogs with vision impairments, not dogs that are blind. Um, and it's kind of uh, today I, I got somebody who um, uh, made a comment on my um, uh, on my YouTube channel regards to. Uh, uh, a green uh, Walter where I'm taking out his stitches. He's seven stitches that he's got in his neck. Uh, and um, he is 180 plus pounds. He's bucking very hard and all that stuff. And this guy, um, just it's a fake account because it's got one subscriber. And um, that's, well, actually most of the accounts that I have or uh, people who follow me have a couple of subscribers. But this is like a one subscriber thing. There's no videos on it, no thing at all. So it's kind of a bit of a troll. But he writes down in his essentially... Uh, you know, I've raised European Great Danes uh, since I was the age of eight years old, including, uh, you know, I've raised blind and deaf uh, Albino Danes and blah, blah, blah. And he's saying that I'm I'm supposed to put uh, Walter on the ground and try to get his stitches out and all that stuff, which is absolutely a dumb statement because Walter is the dog that was considered the most extremely dangerous Great Dane in North America in 2016 and 2017 for attacking 16 people in New York dragged a shelter worker into his kennel, uh, significant uh, viciousness on his end. So to take a dog like Walter on the ground would be absolutely a brute force, ignorant, archaic behavior to do. Alpha is an archaic thing. Alpha is a, uh, it's basically beating up your girlfriend. That's a boyfriend, right? You know, physical abuse, spousal abuse. That's the same thing that it is with, uh, would be to a dog. It's a, um, it's just not effective. It's it's so archaic because it goes back to the times when people would own slaves and people couldn't vote uh, who aren't you know a certain. Or anyways, right? So it's just it's just so it's it's silly. So the guy's saying that I should be putting Walter on the ground and holding him down and making him feel safe and all that stuff. Not when you have a dangerous dog. Dangerous dog is gonna say, "Oh my gosh, you're trying to hurt me. I'm gonna attack you." No matter how friendly they think. We are together, no matter how long of a relationship uh, Walter and I have, he's going to feel you're going to try to beat me like the other six out of seven humans, uh, families that I've been with. And then Walter will then not only betray his trust, because it's, again, if you alpha a dog, you're betraying the dog's trust. You're betraying your dog's trust in you because you're brute forcing them. You're using brute force in an oppressive manner to do so. So when this guy's talking about it, I'm just like, oh my gosh, this guy's just, he's, he, he's dumb. And, and then he starts talking about, uh, you know, 
about being eight years old and raising Danes. And it's like, dude, an eight-year-old could never breed and raise any Great Danes because the Great Dane, by the time they're four months of age, is going to be like 70, 80 pounds, 90 pounds, 100 pounds. So they're going to be significantly huge. There's no way an eight-year-old is going to raise that. Any kind of, uh, I don't know any parent that's going to let their eight-year-old kid raise dogs and breed them as well. And then on top of it, silly statement on this guy's end is on, on top of that is that he's breeding dogs. If this is, I think he's just lying. Or, well, he's probably not lying, but he's a backyard breeder. And I said, he, I said to me, and in my comment, you're a backyard breeder because you're raising. Not only are you raising dogs that you have no idea what you're doing, but you're raising dogs that are double merles that are genetically. Uh, incapable of uh, of of uh, um, uh, generating or, 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 or birthing dogs that are not deaf and blind, and so I I reply back to the guy is you're just a backyard breeder and you're raising dogs that are deliberately going to be blind and deaf. It doesn't make you a good person. It actually makes you a monster. And please don't own another dog. And he hasn't replied uh, since. And it was kind of interesting because a lot of times these people. Um, have such ignorance and they think they know everything yet they don't look at the fact of what they are themselves doing with their dogs so um, anyways I just kind of want to talk over that kind of bugged me today just because it's like don't don't try to school me on something when you yourself are the reason for such profound disability like who who out there is going to breed a dog that you know is going to have a strong possibility of being blind and deaf when they're born. The only people who are going to breed dogs like that, the white dogs, the only people who are going to breed dogs like that are the ones who are looking for money. Use it to spend it on drugs, to buy illicit items, to waste, uh, to be frivolous. Because if you're going to raise dogs, breed dogs that are severely disabled, knowing that what you're doing will lead to severely disabled dogs being born makes you a monster makes you a greedy monster and um, if you're like that I don't care I have very little tolerance for people like that um, it's, just, it's just it's deliberately being like you know it's it just it's just brutal um, okay so uh, ping over other dogs pee all right so the ping over dogs pee right like even in the backyard we'll, we'll see that one of the things I, I kind of want to go on all right, just so I don't go over time, it's late already. Um, it's, it's a dependency issue. It's a self-esteem issue. It's a confidence issue. It's a need for the dog to belong, the dog to create a, a, an affinity with whatever the group is that they may find in the backyard, right? So in my backyard, I've got the other dogs. If I bring in a new dog, then the other dogs will sometimes pee on top of it. It's also a part of maintaining for example, a territorial perimeter and showing predators, potential predators, potential interlopers, that there is a strength in numbers because they're smelling pee in the same area, which means that the dogs or predators can smell different variations of that spot. So they can smell one, two, three, four different dogs, etc. They're going to tell, right? They're going to be key markers. I also suspect, this is my theory, I also suspect that there are probably some similar genetic uh, uh, codes traits that are matching to what the dog is finding an attraction to as well so a dog that's peeing on top of another dog it's pee that's in you know that you're going for a walk and your dog stops and pees on another dog's pee out of all the other spots that other dogs have peed can and i suspect theoretically uh, can indicate a dna or a somewhat familiarity to certain key parts of the key traits of of that so just kind of a little bit of a this because that because why would a dog pee at a certain um place when another dog's peed at it i mean it's here in the backyard i have um uh minky will go outside and he'll pee and he will actually wait for sammy to go pee he'll pee and then he'll wait for sammy he'll follow he'll watch her and sammy will go pee and she's only got two legs and all that and sammy and him get along really well they used to play all the time you saw in the video on my banner. And Sammy will go pee and then Minky will go to where she peed because he'll see her leave and he'll go and sniff where she peed and he'll go up there and he'll stand there and he'll pee and he'll lift his leg up, right? Yesterday, I talked uh, two days ago, I talked about, uh, uh, sorry, my last vlog, I talked about dogs lifting their leg to go pee as a safety measure and all that stuff. On his end, he's doing a mimicking of what he's seeing as an aspect to belong as he pees on top of it 
Sammy's P is not only to create an identity, a self-invitation for him to be part of the group, to be part of her life, so to speak, to be part of uh, Sammy's life. It's that ability for him to also create an inclusion on his own end to feel like he belongs by marking, by putting his P where other dogs have peed that are within his group. Also giving him a sense of self by peeing on top of that as well by self-inviting himself into the group or into Sammy's little circle to not necessarily ingratiate himself into uh, into Sammy's life because he plays with her in, in the house and all that, but it's a psychological issue on a dependency basis um, when it comes to that. Um, and when I just mentioned earlier in regards to the territorial perimeter aspect of, of the area when your dog pees in the same place all the time, right? They pee in certain areas. The, the dysfunctional dog will pee in certain areas and sometimes key points or repeated areas constantly, right? You go on a walk the, that evening, they pee in the same places again, etc., etc. Um, oh, that was a dog. Um, it, it, it's not a dominant trait when it comes to a dog peeing on top of another dog's pee. It, 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 because it doesn't even... And everyone says that, right? And I, I talked about that earlier at the top here. It, it, it's, it's not a dominant point of it. It, it, it is a, a, a low self-esteem issue. It's a dependency issue. That dog is going to pee on top of it. Minky himself has a, a certain types of dysfunctions that he has, aside from you know being born and raised in a in a meat dog farm in in South Korea. He lived there for a year and a half before he was rescued. Um, he, he he and 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 it's all great. Like you know, it's all these big two inch by two inch. Uh, uh, it just it's it's like fencing that's used as a floor. So he, you know, he, the video you can see he's standing on these things, and it's got to be extremely uncomfortable for him. And he's not going to be standing up to lift his leg to go pee. So he imitates the pee of what uh, the peeing manner of what other dogs have done. Like I talked about, uh, Zevia imitating um, female dog imitating male dogs when they go pee. When it comes to um, uh, to Minky when he pees on top of Sammy's part of it, he's lifting his leg and his lift of his leg, because she'll pee in the middle of the backyard. She doesn't pee at the side because she has no legs, uh, no back legs. So she'll pee where she is in the yard and he'll pee and he'll lift up his leg heartedly. So if he's standing here, he'll kind of lift up his leg a little bit like that. And it's just, it's a fake lift, which is like I said, similar to a female dog. Um, why does the dog eat their own poop? Uh, I, I, I'm not talking about that today, Sammy, so um, talk about it some other time. just want to stay on topic because uh, I need to. Um, uh, so, again, when you see another dog peeing on top of another dog, I suspect that there's some DNA, some, some chemical uh, familiarity that the dog is identifying with. Familial or familiar identification when it comes to the dog. Um, uh, which we call it, um, just let's see where before I lost, uh, it, um, uh, yeah, just ping over another dog's piece. Sorry, I, I kind of lost that. I just, I scrolled out here. Um, oh, and another thing too, is if your dog is continuously peeing till the bladder is empty and they're still, you know, peeing, even if it's a drop and sometimes it gets to be no drops whatsoever, right? They're just standing there. And making an effort to pee, and you can tell that they are trying to pee. It's a low self-esteem issue. It's a self-identity crisis that they're having. It's a desire to establish themselves in the neighborhood. It's not a dominant behavior. It is an aspect of establishing their sense of self within the neighborhood, creating a familiarity within the perimeter of the territory that they are always walking around, etc. Um, you know what I should have done? I should have separated this again. I thought I would be able to get the peeing thing and two vlogs uh but like i said in last uh vlog my last vlog that this is such a expansive topic in regards to pee um uh, i'll probably go and talk about this other part of peeing uh later on but again you know peeing on top of the other dogs pee uh territorial it, it creates the establishment to interlopers that there may be more than one dog in the area because they're going to realize okay now i smell two dogs pee where else is there other pee Right, you know when you you talk about the, uh, we talk about those people who could track human beings, right? Humans that can track other human beings in the forest, in the Amazon, in the wild. 
they how they can they can easily track right they watch to see if the branch has been broken they will look at the ground to see whether or not what's been disturbed what's fresh they'll and some of these trackers are so sensitive they can smell just like a dog they can smell the leaf uh, uh, bush brush where there's been a difference in scent because someone's brushed past it etc right so this is the same thing that the dogs do same thing that a tracking dog does is they look for scenting even though they look for scenting on the quantum aspect of it and they create a uh, a map uh, process in their head that's why you see dogs crisscross and then once they crisscross they stop crisscrossing unless they do it to re-verify uh, it's a different topic with regards to tracking same with um if any of those people who have dogs that, uh, you know, do, do search and rescue and they do the tricks, you know, the competitions and all that stuff and they, you know, go to look for somebody, um, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a way to improve that type of dog's, uh, championship abilities to succeed by teaching the dog to rely on their peripheral vision, which is a natural part of the dog's behavior, but is to utilize that because that's what the dog does in a predatorial aspect anyways this uh, like i say this kind of it's a friday i'm doing my friday night uh rants so i'm kind of like all over the place had trouble trying to start up this uh vlog today uh i had to restart my computer i had to cr i had to force quit everything like Arr! so when the new computer comes uh at the beginning of december um i'm getting um uh uh, you know, a better video camera, not the cell phone thing, getting a microphone. Uh, I will hopefully be able to get a, a lot more organized so I'm not getting uh, frazzled by all the stuff going on. But uh, yeah, so, okay, so that that's essentially, um, uh, yeah, establishing sentry points. Yeah, okay, so I talked about the dog pee on the other dog's pee. Establishing sentry points uh, to interlopers that there are more than just one dog to defend the area, that this is, and it also creates a wildlife corridor for any interlopers to understand, oh, this is where the current inhabit inhabitants live. This is where the current inhabitants do their perimeter, do their detail, do their search, do their uh, uh, scouting of the area, right? So then that's why they're gonna pee on top of each other because they know they're dragging their scent through everything. If a dog or, or doesn't wanna be tracked, you can do whatever you can to hide your scent. So when the dogs are doing it overtly, they're doing it on purpose. I will go over this uh, a bit more in detail because I'm not, I feel like I'm not uh, doing enough of a uh, explanation as it kind of goes a little bit off on a bit. Um, but yeah, so dysfunctional dog. Uh, okay, stop. Center, okay, dysfunctional dog that either has above average or below average self confidence and self worth. So that's about the dog that pees all over the place uh, repeatedly and empty pees. Right, I call it empty pee because it is MTP and it's easier to call that as a simple term than anything else. Um, and your dog wants to belong by and by peeing. Okay, so I said that, right? So that's that note in regards to Minky. Yeah, dog wants to belong and by peeing by self-inviting themselves into the perceived group, the perceived family, the perceived pack. They want to self-invite them. By just going, oh, well, if I pee here, then I get to belong part of the group because now I'm doing what everyone else is doing. It's just like the child that mimics someone else that they idolize or that they respect, right? The little child that imitates their parent because they're like, I want to be like daddy. That's similar to what that dog is doing. But I will uh, I will go further into this next uh, on my next vlog when I talk about dogs with vision impairment and I'll walk back on that part. Um uh, so I'm just going to finish this off because I'm about 40 minutes in here. I want to keep my uh, vlogs a bit more reliable so people know that when they are watching it, that's only a certain length of time and that they can uh, allocate a certain length of time. And uh, I know people have uh, commented to me um, and sent me messages and said, hey, you know what? It's hard to watch your vlog sometimes because sometimes you're two hours and sometimes you're 45 minutes and sometimes you're an hour and 15. And if it's hard to get uh, to the topic right away, then we realize that it's going to be a little while before James gets into the topic itself. So I want to keep things a bit more cleaner. And um, I want to thank everybody for uh, tuning in to watch me on a Friday night. Uh, you know, you could be doing a lot more different things like watching Netflix and chilling. Um, please follow me on my YouTube channel. The links are in my description on my, uh, on my post here. Uh, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Help me spread the word of what I'm doing and the work that I'm uh, spent. Uh, I, 
you know, today I met up with a couple of people. Uh, one of them is a friend of mine and her friend, and we discussed about dogs and so forth like that. And, um, you know, one of the questions they asked me is, James, how do you know, right? You're saying this and this and this, but how do you know how it's going to work? Um, and how did you know? And what I've explained to them is that I have spent over 1,400 days, 1,400 days, over 20,000 hours alone with predatorial giant dogs, smaller dogs, minky, you know, meat dogs. I spent over 20,000 hours one-on-one -on -one by myself at, at great uh, uh, um, mortal risk to my life uh, to learn from these amazing dogs that have been unfortunately victimized severely that I've learned the behaviors and the stuff that I've worked with them as I interact with what I suspect or, or theorize to what the dog's actual reaction behavior and when I've been able to do so I have learned I've made mistakes I have been bitten I have been attacked by the dogs uh, that are in my home uh, in the especially in the beginning and so it's an aspect of respect or me just making an error in judgment at that time as I think okay maybe it's this way and then something will happen or the dog themselves will be so victimized that their level of distrust will then surface from the subconscious behavior to an overt physical action towards me due to their historical experiences uh, but all these things have happened teaches me so even if a dog reacts on their own end it's up to me to learn from that reason and to look for those signs and do accident reconstruction to go, okay, what was their behavior be before that? Uh, you know, one of the things I, I, I want to say too as well is, um, and I mentioned this today, is people that see visually and uh, they see visually or they see, you know, they look at somebody go, oh, that person looks like so-and-so, you know, that kind of thing where you identify something. That's not a Horshack aspect of it, a Horshack. It's, it's the part of like, oh, I see something. And this person, they look familiar, they look like this actor, they look like that actor, whatever. Those are the kind of um, intuitive behaviors that if you have those kinds of things, that will help you progress your own ability with reading dogs. With what I'm doing is that part of it, is if you start identifying uh, similar traits and uh, traits in one dog, and you'll start to see similar traits in other dogs. And then create that um, template, that streamlining, where that... Uh, key particular uh, trait of behavior is like stereotyping is common throughout similar dogs and that type of personality put the pieces together like a Lego block and then you have something solid that you can rely on then you can start doing what I'm doing which is to start reading dogs with that everything that I've learned uh, has been at great risk and uh, I'm happy to share everything that I'm doing please share my work please help me promote the stuff Thank you so much for, uh, you know, checking in on a Friday with my vlog. Uh, again, this is, what is it? This is uh, episode number 34. And um, I'm, I'm flattered to have people watching what I'm doing. Um, you know, my vlog on Wednesday, Why Dogs Lift Their Leg to Go Pee. Um, you know, it's already got like over 800 views. So I am always uh, just, it's very cool. It's very, it's very flattering. Um, okay, so thank you so much, and I will see everybody on Monday, and I'll be talking about, again, I'll, I'm going to kind of revisit and finesse out the, um, the the dogs peeing on top of other dogs' pee, and the dysfunctions behind that, the insecurities, the dependency, the low self-esteem, you know, all these issues, as well as talk about uh, uh, how to work with a dog that has vision impairment issues, and I'll do that first, about vision impairment, and then I'll go into the topic in regards to peeing again. And then, you know, we'll go from there. Thank you again, everybody. Enjoy yourself on this uh, beautiful Friday. And uh, have tolerance. Uh, and don't blame yourself for the things that have happened in the past of your life. Make that as a building blocks to move yourself forward. Use the past as a foundation to create a solid structure, a solid foundation, a solid point in time. No matter what happened in your past, right? No matter what happened in your past make whatever in your past is part of that foundation but try not to live in the past try to move forward on that and by being progressive and being optimistic as the future with a realistic goal you can achieve some most amazing things in your life we're all capable of doing these amazing things in our life relative to our own skill set relative to our own experience this is something that you guys yourself have it inside of you um you know when i first started out september 24th uh, i was super nervous and those of you who can watch those vlogs uh, from the beginning, super nervous. My voice uh, 
just uh, you know stick to what it is that you believe and follow that dream of yours even if it may not seem significant to you but it's a dream and that dream is important inside of your heart follow that through be successful in achieving those things when people try to put you down try to attack you try to say things about that just fluff it off they're not doing what you can do and even if they were doing the same thing hey you're doing what you can do to the best enjoyable ability that you have and if it makes you happy absolutely very very cool be happy with what you do like Bobby McFerrin be happy uh, don't worry be happy right um, just do what it is that you feel happy about reward yourself for the things that the little things that you've done realize how incredible you are as a human being thank you everybody have a great Friday and we will talk later bye bye